What a song. I want you to recall for just a moment in your life, grace. Now think for just a second about that before you answer these questions about that. Do you take it for granted? Is it even something that's unseen? It could be even this morning, as I mentioned the word grace, there's some here in this very audience who say, oh, no, 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 we don't want to talk about grace. It's been abused, it's been misused, it's been made into something that it, that it isn't. <laughs> yeah. Grace is something that the Bible speaks about on almost every page of Scripture in some way or another. It's not easily defined, actually. We... We have a brief and concise definition, as we'll talk about this morning, but the way that it works and the things that grace has done, does do, and is seen are many. More than we'll be mentioning and talking about this morning. I want to remind you of a passage from God's Word in 1 John chapter 4, and in verse 9, where it simply says this, The love of God was made manifest among us, that, uh, that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. Now, what I'm going to suggest to you this morning is that, concisely stated, that passage is speaking of grace. I mean, it's, it's really giving a biblical definition of what grace is in the sight of God, and therefore, as we learn from God in our sight as well. Our, our mission this morning, then, is to refresh our memory, our thoughts, or as the case may be, even extend our thoughts deeper into what this concept is from Scripture called grace, and particular with regard to how we see God's grace in or through Jesus, the Messiah. As we turn our Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 9, we can see a, a story from a just a short story from the life of David about a man named Mephibosheth, which will serve as an allegory about where we'll start, and that is human interaction with regard to grace as is seen from God. God's grace seen in human interaction, or the use of God's grace seen in our actions today. It's great to be here this morning. I hope you feel the same way. I, I, I suspect that if you've been involved in our worship together today, you, you do feel that way. Uh, I don't know how you couldn't. I appreciate so much the, the men who help lead us and guide our hearts and minds in, in uh, wholesome and good worship to God. Um, and, uh, and all the work that they put into that is not taken for granted. And I would encourage you as we study this morning together that if you're not accustomed to being here, maybe it's the first time that you visited today, uh, how thankful we are to have you here. But also, uh, we want to encourage you to use your Bible. Now, a lot of places today, people don't even bring their Bible to worship services, and we just want you to understand this is worship to God. What better place to look about how to do that and, and how we gain from that than by opening up God's Word together. And so, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 9, if maybe you're not familiar with God's Word very much yet, that's page 307 in the, the Bible that's in the rack there in front of you. And uh, we'd encourage everyone who, uh, who doesn't have a Bible to use your Bible this morning. 2 Samuel chapter 9, page 307. And uh, if you don't own a Bible, then our, our desire is for you to take that Bible home. It's our gift to you. Uh, because we, we firmly believe everyone should have the Word of God at their disposal. Grace should grab our attention. And the reason that it grabs our attention is the same thing that you're thinking right now as you see these images that are there uh, behind me. The reason it grabs our attention is because it cuts against learned traits. These are not the traits we learn from the world. I mean, the way that the world normally functions is not seen in images like this, is it? And that's why there's these kind of images, because it isn't typical. It's not the normal that we have learned our, our learned uh, uh, thoughts and actions 
Don't fall into what's going on in these pictures. Grace is a decided disposition and intention of unowed kindness or goodness. In the situation we're looking at it here, towards somebody we may not even know in these pictures. It is the display of favor that has not been gained or earned somehow, is not owed to us. Grace is utterly something that is undeserved in its very nature, or it isn't really grace. Now, it's important to keep those kind of thoughts in our mind as we go through what we're looking at this morning from God's Word. So turn with me there, if you're not already there, hope that you are, in 2 Samuel chapter 9. And this, this is uh, a, a place, there are various uh, places that we could look at that show the same kind of illustration, uh, but this is one of the best in my mind at least that is found in God's Word with regard to the human interaction with regard to grace. And we begin reading together in verse 1 of this text. David says, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Remember, Jonathan earlier in his life was his best friend. And, and, uh, and Jonathan was also Saul, the first king of Israel's son. Now David is king, and he says, I want to show kindness to somebody. Is there anybody that is left in the house of Saul for Jonathan's sake? Verse 2, now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And they called, to, uh, called him to David. And the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. Now that's important because he's saying, I'm not Saul, the dead king's servant. I now belong to your service. And then he says, uh, the king says to him, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God? Underline that if you are are used to marking in your scriptures. That I may show not the kindness of David. He says that I may show the kindness of God to him. Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. Jump down to verse 5. Then David sent and brought him. Jump down to verse 6. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold, I am your servant. And David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan, and I will restore you all the land of Saul your father, and you shall eat at my table always. Look at verse 11. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king commands his servant, so will your servant do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Verse 13, So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate always at the king's table. Now, the, now he was lame in both feet. In chapter 4, if you're making side notes there, in chapter 4 of this same book, we learn that it says he was lame in both his feet because when Saul, his grandfather, and Jonathan, his father, were in a battle and were killed in that battle at, at uh, Mount Geboa, Mephibosheth, it says, was five years old, and when the news about Saul and Jonathan came to his household, to the palace, his nurse took him up and fled speedily. And as she fled, the text says, in her haste, she, uh, he fell and became lame. So it was not of his own court in any of his habits. In fact, he's five years old when his disability uh, is uh, thrust on him. So David here is a solid biblical example, we might say, of grace in human interaction. One human to another, with God in sight as the purpose or reason because of it. And in particular, in this case, it's even because of his kindness or his love toward his past friend Jonathan, even. Why does it stand out to us when we see grace being exhibited from one human to another? Why does that stand out to us? I mean, why does that make the news, right? 
Why, why do people take pictures of that and put it in magazines? Why is that such a big deal? The reason it's a big deal is because it doesn't happen very often compared to what we normally see around us. It's an abnormality of normal circumstances. What about grace in your life? Between you and others for just a second. I've seen the way some of you drive. It's without grace. And that's in the church parking lot. <laughs> grace in human interactions, a pretty unusual thing, honestly. It has to be intentional, doesn't it? It has to be purposeful. It has to be thought through. We might see a lack of grace toward the guy or the girl at work who make it awful hard for people to get along with them. You get along with them through grace. They're not owed any favors by you. They're not owed any goodness that comes from you, but because of God's grace in your life, you show grace for them. Well, like David and Mephibosheth. Sometimes we see a lack of grace in physical families. Sometimes we see a lack of grace in spiritual families. We see a lack of grace toward that person who, who, who looks destitute or maybe a homeless man or woman who's out on the corner somewhere begging. And, and we may not have any insight as to their background, but just think to ourselves, I owe that person nothing, therefore they get nothing. Could it be, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, that normally we are more often the enemy of grace in our thoughts and in our actions than we are the friends of grace? This is why actions like that of David stand out to us. Because such grace between people is infrequent rather than frequent. It's my conclusion, brothers and sisters, and maybe you would agree with this, that God intends for us to be people of grace. In other words, we display the kind of attitudes we see in Him. Just as an absence of grace is learned from an evil world that we have grown up in, so the presence of grace is taught by a loving God that we grow up in. God calls us to be a source of grace to others. And we could see this in many places. James 1, 27. Psalms chapter 10, verse, verse 12 talks about how we ask God to be a God of grace, uh, that we may be of grace to others. Now, this is further seen in Jesus during the time of his short ministry on earth. For example, here in Luke chapter 13, verse 11, we read that there was a woman for 18 years who had a sickness caused by a spirit. And it says that she was bent double and could not straighten up at all. And, and the text goes on in the very next verse to say Jesus heals her. And she praises God or glorifies God for that. But what we're using that little, that little piece of text for is to show us that in Jesus' earthly ministry, He was a person of grace. He did what he did not have to do and that no one was owed. Yet he did it anyway. Out of his goodness. In John chapter 5, verse 5, one man was at a pool of healing that was there in the day and he had been in an invalid for 38 years, the text says. Verse 6 says, when Jesus saw him laying there and he knew that he'd already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? And the sick man answers and he gives excuse why he's not healed because he could not first get into the pool that was a pool of healing. Verse 8, Jesus said to him, get up and take up your bed and walk. We talked about in the adult Bible class here in the auditorium this morning, Brother Nathan talked about Luke chapter 10, the Good Samaritan. It's an example of the grace of one human toward another based on the kind of God we serve. Well, let's spread this out just a little bit more. In Luke chapter 6, verse 44, Jesus says there, No one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up in the last day. And what we're reading about that there 
what we're reading about here in this is that the grace of God is at work through Jesus. Now, here's the important part. To us today, it's great to read those other places where it's talking about Jesus healed this person or healed that person. And maybe our mind first goes to, well, there was a reason for that. Now, I'll tell you the reason for that. It wasn't just so that people could see He was the Son of God and could do a miracle. It was because He cared about that person and He showed them grace. And everybody saw that. Well, this is talking about you and me even today. Unless the Father has drawn us, how did He do that? He's asked us to come to Him. He draws us. You know, that's grace that He would even draw us. That He would care enough to even draw us. And then it talks about raising up in the last day. I kind of doubt any of us think we're worth that. John chapter 15, verse 5. Here's another familiar passage to some of us. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. Now notice this. For apart from me, you can do nothing. You know what that's talking about then? If we're able, enabled to do something that we are not able to do apart from Him, He causes that to, to take place. You know what that's called? That's called grace because we didn't deserve it. We're not owed it, but He's doing it. That's, that's the idea set forth in the word grace that we use. Apart from Me, you can do nothing unless the Father draws. These are statements of, of grace at work through Christ. Somebody may say, well, Nate, I understand where you're going with that, but you really need to understand that's really talking about God's mercy, not grace. And I'd like to rebut that idea and simply point out that unearned mercy is God's grace in action. In fact, I would say a big part of God's grace is seen through God's mercy mercy, His goodness. Unless, of course, somebody thinks that they're worthy of the mercy that God is giving, then it wouldn't be grace. It would be payment. If these people had no way of giving aid to their problem, and Jesus comes along and He shows mercy to them, and He, he fixes them, so to speak, without their payment, especially in reference to the miracles that we read just a minute ago, between Jesus and some of those that, that we talked about. If He comes along and, and he, he blesses them in some way without their effort being exerted on that, or because they somehow deserved it based upon their own goodness or their own work, then we would say, if that's not the case, then that's called grace. That's what that's called. The application of unearned favor from God as we look at Jesus' actions. Unearned, unwarranted, unjustified, undeserved. We could go on with synonyms like that that describe what we're talking about. And when it comes to our relationship to God, brothers and sisters, it is the basis of everything between us and God. Everything. Maybe you think I'm overstating that. Maybe you're just following right along and you get it. Either way, someone may be saying in their mind, well, you know, I, I've repented and I've been baptized and, and that's why God has shed grace upon me. And I just want to say to you, that is not true. That is false thinking. That has never been true for any of us. Grace was given before we knew anything, before we even existed. Grace was given before we got an inkling of what sin was about, or repentance was about, or baptism was about. These actions did not result, brothers and sisters, in God's grace being bestowed upon us. But in fact, they, those things are items of faith in a response to God's grace already having been given. I hope that's not confusing to you. If it is, I hope that it becomes clear as we continue on. 
I would hope that we would resist such thinking regarding anything we do that is called good. The only reason what we do as children of God, as Christians, means anything to God at all is because He first said, that will mean something to me. It is all established on His first step towards us in undeserved mercy or grace. Everything is built upon that. Every good deed you do, every good thought you have is built simply upon the mighty grace of God and His bestowing of that through Jesus. The Bible confirms this conclusion. I don't know how we could get away from it. Going back to that passage we started with there in 1 John chapter 4, look again at verse 9. Would anything matter at all, brothers and sisters, if God had not first sent His Son into the world so that we might live through Him? It was God who established a foundation upon which everything else in our life grows. And without it, nothing would mean anything. It is God's undue favor on us that makes our response of faith in humble obedience mean something to Him and to us and to others around us. Notice there in verse 10 of, their, uh, of that text of 1 John chapter 4, In this is love not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son. Those words, sent His Son, is God's grace on display through Jesus. To be the propitiation for our sins. Sometimes we stumble over that word, propitiation. It's an old word. We don't use it much anymore. If you're taking notes and you have a struggle with that word when, it, when you read it, maybe publicly or even in, in your own personal reading. It just simply means appeasement. A payment to satisfy God's deserved wrath upon us. That word speaks of grace. None of us would be free from sin and saved at all if we had not depended, or if we had simply depended upon our own efforts, if it were not for God's grace, no matter what, we would still be lost. We've dug ourselves so deep into a pit that there is no hope of ever escaping. We didn't come out that way when we were first born, but we dug that for ourselves and we kept digging that so deep that there was no hope of survival. Our debt owed was, was not this five-year plan of good works to get out of debt, right? I mean, it's not this 30-year plan or a million-year plan. I'm thinking about uh, Matthew chapter 18 for a second. That guy was delivered over to the torturers until he should pay his debt. And you can't pay a debt when you're getting tortured. There's no going to work. There's no gaining money. Jesus' example is with regard to eternal death. And it makes the, paint, it makes the point to the reader. Never-ending death, that's... Eternal imprisonment, that, that, that right there, that's the debt. That's what's actually owed to us. In fact, uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 23 would, would point that out by saying the wages of sin, that's our, that's, our, that's our owe for the work we've done, is death. But the free gift of God, well, that's grace at work, and that's eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do we understand then what God has graciously given. I don't mean understand it fully, but do we, do we, are we understanding it? Are we growing in that direction with regard to our relationship to God and understanding what is, what it, where it is derived from? I mean, what really is the engine behind it all? And we give thanks to God for all His wonderful deeds. AJ, Brother A.J. read in the Scripture reading this morning, Psalm 66, 
Verse 5, come and see what God has done. He is awesome in His deeds toward the children of man. Verse 8 would say, bless our God, O people. Let the sound of His praise be heard who has kept our souls among the living. That's grace at work. That's God doing something on our behalf that we do not, absolutely do not deserve or are not owed His plan, His free gift offered to us. Escape, freedom from death and destruction. How we ought to give thanks for that. And may it provoke within us a response of discipleship. I mean real discipleship. Dedicated discipleship. We owe Him everything because of His grace towards us. We all or have been like Mephibosheth. He was physically handicapped. Worse than that, we've been spiritually handicapped. We've been invited into the King's presence. Ephesians 1, verses 5 and 6. To forever sit at His table. Taken in. Taken in. To be His child forevermore. To sit at His table. How could we ever doubt the love God has for us how easy it is to do that. You know, my day's not going right. <sighs> feel lousy, feel worthless about how life is right now. Brother, sister, if that's where you're at in your life, will you step back, truly look at your life? Is it the physical things that you're looking for to make you happy? Is it everything working? I want to say, that's coming. That's called heaven. One day... All that we ever thought or wanted or could ever imagine will be handed over to us by God's grace. That's not where we are. Where we are right now is we are bathing in His grace with regard to our salvation and so many more things that we could mention. Look at what the writer is teaching us here in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, He predestined us to adoption. He had this plan. We get to be part of that plan. And then He says, as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glory and grace, step back from life. Look at yourself in regard to who you are with God and everything in this world becomes minimal. I'm not saying we've got to go around Moses with our heads stuck in the clouds, but I tell you what, when things aren't the way we wish they were in this life, we better step back and we better think about the grace of God at work in our life because those things that we might think are so important become worthless to us without our salvation. They all end in nothing. How could we ever doubt the love of God seen in His grace? Psalm 136, God, uh, Give thanks to, to the Lord, for He is good. His steadfast love endures forever. There's no heart like God's heart. And there's no grace as abundant as His. And understanding God's grace should become a source of great thanks to us, who especially are His children. I want you to notice something else about this, though. And that is, coming from Romans chapter 5, how God's grace is a source of our great confidence as Christians. It's what gives us great confidence because of who it's established in. Nobody like Him. I want you to underscore in your text briefly there, down in verse 6, just underscore some of the words that we're going to see here in this text. I'm going to help you out by putting it up here on the board, okay? Verse 6, while we were still, what? Somebody say the word. Weak. We were weak. That's who we were. You want to define yourself before coming into Christ? Weakness. That's the definition of who we were. Look at what else he says about ourselves. At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, we might have some weirdness about how we think about the word ungodly. Let me just point out, it means those without God. Godless, without Him in their life. And then down, down in verse 8, we were, he says, sinners. And look down in verse 10 of that text. We were what? 
enemies of him. Man, that's a description I don't like. I don't know about, I mean, I, well, I do know about you. None of us like that description. No one likes that description. That is defining who we were. Now, I want you to connect, couple together these words with the other words that we see in these very same verses. Verse 6, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. That is grace at work. Look at verse 8. God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, what does He say again? Christ died for us. And then down in verse 10, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Much more, He goes on to say, now that we are reconciled, we shall be saved by our life. Our good works. <laughs> Negatory. All of our good deeds. Notice that and underline that word in your text. He, he makes the point, we shall be saved by His life, not ours. That's grace. That's grace. We didn't, we didn't do anything to deserve His life. And then down in verse 20, the law came in to increase the trespasses. And if I could just insert a parenthetical statement there, the law came in to increase our understanding, is the point, of trespassing God's will. And that's all law can do. That's the only thing it's designed for. God didn't make it to do anything else. Anything else people try to derive out of the law is not made by God. It's man-made. The only purpose for law in the sight of God is to point out transgression. It is incapable of offering grace or mercy or forgiveness for that matter. For those things, we've got to have a judge who's looking at the law and something else. In this case, the blood of Jesus on our behalf. Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life. You know what that means in, in kind of just short terms? That when God looks at us, and I know we are accustomed to it, and in one sense it is true, we are all sinners. But what this verse is telling us is that when God looks at us, He doesn't see a sinner. He sees someone rinsed off by the blood of Jesus. What He can do, and we can't, He does. He looks at us through the prism of grace so that it might reign in righteousness, leading us to eternal life. And how is it manifest to us, He says down at the end of that verse, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, just as David sought out and found Methus uh, uh, Mephis not Methuselah, Mephibosheth. <laughs> just as he sought out and, and, and found Me uh, Mephibosheth, so God through Jesus has sought us out, brothers and sisters. Friends, maybe you're not even a Christian yet. I want you to notice. He's seeking you. He wants to find you. And though we may have resisted Maybe you're in the condition right now where you're continuing to resist His call, His finding of you. Still like Adam, hiding. We come to understand it is not for our harm, it is for our good He seeks us. I want you to think for just a second. Can you imagine what it must have been like for Mephibosheth, in Mephibosheth's mind when he hears that knock on his door and it is David's men you know, you, maybe you didn't realize this, but it is true that when one king took over the place of another king, the new king began exterminating the old king's family. All of them, so they would never be able to rise up and contest the, king, the kingship. I can only imagine what must have been going on in his mind. But what's happening? Well, what is actually happening is where Mephibosheth might have felt, I'm a dead man. David is saying, I search you out to give life 
You don't have to live the way you've been living. Because of God in my life, I give grace to you, Mephibosheth. I want to say to you, when it comes to our relationship to our God, Christ has made it so that we can have confidence in our salvation. More than that, without it, we would have remained weak in ungodliness as sinners and enemies. Our confidence, our very confidence as Christians, comes not because of how great we are. It comes to us from the work God has done through Jesus. If you're basing your confidence in salvation on all the great things you do or have done or will do, I want to say to you, you will live in fear. It is only the grace of God who gives us the confidence. And why is that? Because it raises far above what we are capable of. It gives what we cannot give ourselves. Well, finally, as we conclude here, Ephesians chapter 2, and I appreciate your good attention this morning. Ephesians chapter 2, we'll look at this passage as, as, we, as we close out this morning. And I want you to turn over there to that. And while you're turning over there to that, I want to read to you from John chapter 1, verse 14. It serves as a great backdrop for what we're looking at in Ephesians chapter 2. So John 1, verse 14, if you're taking notes, uh, it, it says that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. And then notice what He goes on. And listen to what He says. Full of grace and truth. Verse 16 would go on to say, we have received grace upon grace, which is the same thing as saying we have, des we have received undeserved favor upon undeserved favor from God. Ephesians 2 then, in verse 1, further elaborates on all of this. I, I'm sorry, I, I meant to have uh, that other text up there, but I just left it out in, in John. John 1, 14, if you're taking notes. Ephesians 2, verse 1, further elaborates on this. You who were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked following the course of this world, verse 3, we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desire of the body and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. In other words, we became as our grandfather, Adam, and everyone who has lived since him in corruption because of the natural choices we're making in this world. We make choices based upon worldliness rather than godliness is what that is saying. And in doing that, we have dug ourselves into the pit as we talked about earlier. Like the rest of mankind, he says. We're not... No one is exempted. Verse 5, Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace, God's unearned favor, you have been saved. And by grace, we are raised up a reference, no doubt, to baptism. And by grace, we are He has seated us with Him. Unseparated is the idea. In the heavenly places, in or through Christ Jesus. Now look at verse 7 of that text. Verse 7. So that in the coming ages He might draw us he might show us immeasurable riches of His grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is a gift of God. Maybe those kind of verses have caused you consternation over the years. I'm just saying to you this morning it should not in any way, shape, or form. After learning of God's immense grace in our lives, don't you just wonder how we ever lived without it? Now let me tack on there with that. Don't make the mistake of thinking you ever did. We have never lived without the grace of God. We all experience the grace of God in one shape or form from lesser to greater things. Every breath that we breathe into our lungs comes by the grace of God. We don't deserve it. He just does it. The food that we eat, 
the relationships that we have. And then, of course, most importantly, as we've looked at this morning, the union we have with God through Jesus. Utterly built upon grace. He gave himself, Galatians 1 verse 4 says, for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. Jesus, hanging upon the cross, is grace manifested. <laughs> Now, if you believe this, make no mistake, that ought to result in something. Affection for us should result in affection in return. We didn't manifest the affection first. Get me, get me straight. God did. But ladies and gentlemen, that should provoke within us a response. If we really understand what we've been talking about this morning... May you and I respond to God's grace as we are intended to respond in thanks, in love, in faithful obedience for the remainder of our days. An undeserving grace should provoke an understanding within us. We don't have anything else to offer in return except who we are, and the works that by faith we now are prompted to perform. We want to be like Him because of grace. May we always give glory to God for His abundant grace at work in our life every second of our existence. Maybe you're having trouble with all of this. Maybe you think in your mind, you know, maybe I haven't been thinking about grace the right way. Maybe I never thought about grace at all. I've been thinking my salvation is based on things that I do. I want you to stop for a minute and look at Jesus there upon the cross. In your mind, this is what you see. You don't just see someone who's dying. You see God offering grace for you and for me. What is your response to that? Do you walk away unaffected? Do you know what's taken place and the change in all of history for you and for me? I'm begging you this morning. God, better yet, is searching for you this morning. And His purpose is that you not walk away from that unaffected. That you respond to that grace that's been given to you. Confess Christ to be God's source of salvation unto grace. Baptize for the forgiveness of your sins. Somebody say, wait, 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 wait. Uh, this is work. Talk about work. Oh my goodness. If you think that's work, just think about what God's already done so you could do that. There's no boasting or bragging in becoming obedient because of the great grace of God that He has shed. I'm just saying to you, that's not really work. When you and I go under that water, brother, sister, friend, we're not doing any work. God's the one who's taking away the sin. God's the one who's shedding His grace. God's the one who's performing what we are unworthy of having performed. That's grace at work. He offers, of our, offers us our salvation. And then He performs another act of grace that we oftentimes don't think about, and He adds us to His heavenly bound family. Now we've even got support on that end of it all. That's the grace of God at work. Don't deserve to be there. I don't deserve to be here with you all. By the grace of God, here we are. And let's not take that for granted. doesn't matter where you came from. doesn't matter who you've been in your life. God can take care of everything. What matters is where you're going and who you're going there with. If it's heaven, then why don't you put that in concrete this morning? If that's where you want to go, then respond to His grace right now. While together we stand.
and as we sing.